If you were watching last month, you might think, man, that's a rerun, taking control of your faith. No, it's not. This series was so long when I shared this with our folks here at Empowered Church uh, that it took several uh, weeks to get it done. And I, and I feel like that I don't want to leave you hanging. Now, we can't play this entire series, of course, the restrictions that we have on television, but we're going to go into a, another portion of this message series taking control of your faith. When I come back, I'm going to tell you how you can get that entire series on audio, CD, or USB. Stay around. I'll be back. I grew up in a church atmosphere <clears throat> where that people didn't think you could take control of much of anything. Uh, they just thought you were kind of out of control and hoping that Jesus would, wishing that Jesus would hurry up and come get us and take us out of here. The fact is, <clears throat> God has put us in control of things that are going on in our life. In fact, He's put us in control of our faith, how much faith that we have and how much faith that we operate in. Uh, in our last meeting, we talked about the importance of your faith being active. <clears throat> One of the greatest revelations probably I've ever gotten, probably top 10, I wrote a book on this, Believing. Um, it's called Beyond Faith Believing. It, it, it's the revelation that believing is something that is a step further than faith. Um, it, to take control of your faith, your faith has to be active. You've got to learn to do your faith. James chapter 2, verse 17. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture out of James in the next little bit. So if you can like mark a place there if you're using a hard copy of your Bible. This is the Amplified Bible. One verse of Scripture I want to read that says, verse 17, So also faith, if it does not have works, deeds and actions of obedience to back it up, by itself is destitute of power, it is inoperative, and it is dead. Now that sounds kind of wild, doesn't it? Uh, when, when I grew up in church hearing, if you had faith, you'd do anything. Well, there's a lot of people that have faith that never use their faith. And if you don't use your faith, it's not going to accomplish anything. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to go back to James chapter 2 here in just a few moments. Jay, uh, I just want to get a foundation established this evening. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, your assurance. Same thing that faith produces. He said, which hath a great recompense of reward. I've told you guys before that literally in the Greek says, a mega payment of wages due, or a mega payday. He said, for you have need of patience or constancy, endurance. Watch this line, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. See, this does away with the idea that all you have to do is have faith. He said you've got to do the will of God. <clears throat> Skip down to verse 38. He said, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, I'm talking about drawing back from faith, my soul, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Go back to James chapter 2 with me. We're going to read a few verses there. <clears throat> In James chapter 2. Verse 22, I'm going to read out of the Amplified again, but you can follow along whatever Bible you've got. You see that his faith, this is talking about Abraham, by the way. We're going to talk some about him. Uh, he was uh, very interestingly called the father of them that believe. That would make him like an example for people. <clears throat> I've heard people say they're the father of rock and roll or the father of a certain type of music or the father or the mother of a certain thing that is going on in the world. That means they've kind of invented the thing. I mean, we understand that, that uh, it was Jesus that was the author and the finisher of, the, of our faith, but the Scripture is pretty clear about Abraham being the, the guy in the Old Testament. He's the faith man. And if you want to see anything about faith and understand things about faith, you can look at the life of Abraham. Now watch this verse 22, the Amplified again. 
says, you see that his faith was cooperating with his works. See, I want to stress this tonight. This is so important. And his faith was completed <clears throat> and reached its supreme expression when he implemented it by good works. In other words, Abraham didn't just say, I believe, I'm persuaded. You know, that's what the word believe, I'm, I'm persuaded. And then see the blessings and the goodness and the promises of God come to pass. The Bible says over and over again that he connected his works with his faith. Verse 17, if you back up there, the, the 20th century New Testament says, in the same way, faith, if not followed by actions, is by itself a lifeless thing. We learned that the word faith is a noun in our last service, and, and that the word believe, almost every one of the 300 plus times it's used in the New Testament, it's a verb. Now, when I was a kid in grade school, I remember them trying to explain the difference between the verb and a noun. And I remember still what they told me. They said that a verb is a doing word. A noun is a person, place, or a thing. Did they use that for you guys when you were in school? A doing word, a verb. In other words, something's happening. There's got to be some action. Believing is faith that is in motion, or faith that is active. And there's no wonder that James said in James 1 and 22, be ye doers of the word. You think James was on to something here? I mean, he's Jesus' brother. He grew up in the house with Jesus. And he said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Believing becomes a part of your whole being, spirit, soul, and body, because it's faith in action. I want you to get this. Believing becomes, first of all, faith is part of, the, uh, part of your, your spirit or your heart. Galatians chapter 5 says it's part of the fruit of the spirit. It's an object. It's a thing that is lodged and grows in your spirit. But the scripture is very clear that believing reaches out into our whole man, spirit, soul, and body. It affects what you think. It affects what you say. It affects how you act. It affects everything in your life, what you believe, putting your faith into motion. Several years, God spoke to me and said that faith is like having a toolbox full of tools. Well, that's interesting. I was a carpenter, a builder at the time. He said, you've got to get them out and use them to get a job done. You can't just leave the tools in the toolbox and say, you know, that's what people do. Well, I've got faith. Big deal. I've got tools. I haven't built a house for 20 years, but I've got tools. I've got tools to build a house with, but there's no houses being built because I'm not doing anything with my tools. And just like people can say, I've got faith, but they're not doing anything with their faith, nothing is happening in many people's lives because of it. Believing is like getting your tools out and getting a job done. Faith means to be persuaded. But believing means to put your faith into motion, into action. It's evident in your words and in your actions, the things that you do. And again, Abraham, go with me to Romans chapter 4. I want to read a little bit about him. He's called the father of them that believe. And this is interesting. He's not called the father of them that have faith. And I, I know sometimes people think, well, you're splitting hairs. No, the, when, when these people wrote the Bible, these New Testament letters, they knew the difference in these words. We don't because we've kind of blurred them all together. Well, I'm a believer. Uh, I have faith. Well, I believe. Well, there's a difference in that, biblically speaking. And if you don't know that, there'll be a confusion many times in your life or in people's lives. Abraham is called the father of them that believe. That means he's a biblical case study for faith in motion. Hmm. Abraham knew, to, he, he knew how to take control of his faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, 
but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, you, you got to know what grace is, and we've talked about this, but there's some people watching, listening that don't know that grace, the New Englishman's Greek Concordance and Lexicon says that grace is everything that God is capable of doing because he's sovereign, which means he makes the rules, and everything that was finished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's by grace are you saved, Ephesians chapter 8, or 2 and verse 8. That word saved is sozo, it means wholeness. He says, by grace are you saved through faith. He said, in other words, you have to access the grace, everything that Jesus finished, through faith. He said the same thing in essence here. He said, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. He said, if you want to get a hold of the grace, it's, it, you've got to go through the faith to get it. That's the way it comes. Now, the next verse I want to read out of the New American Standard Bible. Some of these things this the, made it a little more clear. Verse 17, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Back to the King James Version, verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope. He's talking about Abraham. You guys know the word hope means to expect. Now, there was an expectation that Abraham had. Does everybody know that Abraham was 99 years old and his wife was 89 years old and they had never had a child together? Sarah had never had a child. Abraham had fathered a child with her handmaiden, but they had not had children together. And God came and spoke to them. And when she was 89, he was 99 and said, this time next year, you're going to have a baby. You have a son. In fact, he said, if you want to look up at the stars, count the stars. He said, you'll be able to count your descendants or look at the sand on the seashore. If you can count that, you can count your descendants. He said, and all nations of the earth are going to be blessed through your seed. That's a big promise. You're 99 years old. You ain't ever had a baby with your wife yet. The Bible says she was called barren. She was past childbearing, but not just past childbearing. She had never had a child when she was capable or when she was an, of an age that she should have had a child. So the Bible says that Abraham had to take on a different perspective. Instead of looking at things or expecting things, that's what the word hope means, expecting things in the natural to take place, now he gets a word from God and he expects God's word to come to pass in his life. As it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Watch, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So the way he, he didn't just randomly blindly say, I'm going to be a father of many nations. God came to him and gave him a word. God spoke to him and gave him a promise. Look verse 19, and being not weak in faith, the New American Standard says, without becoming weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. I want to talk about that for just a moment. He considered everything that was going on around him, but he would not let that consideration change his faith. If you look back into the original Greek text, the Bible says that he, he looked at it and considered the things that were around him, but he would not allow the things that he was seeing to affect his faith. In other words, he had more faith. He was more persuaded that the word of God was going to come to pass in his life than what everybody else was expecting to come to pass. He staggered not, wavered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. I almost feel like he is superhuman in this verse. I don't know if this works this way for you, but every once in a while, 
there's a human side of me comes out and there is a staggering that takes place. There is a wavering that takes place. Not near as often as it has in the past because I've just learned to uh, consider the stuff that's around, but I consider God's word more true than the stuff that's around. That's what faith is. Just like Abraham looked at all the stuff that was around, but he chose to trust the Lord instead of putting his confidence in things that was going on around him. He said, the, the scripture says that he didn't waver at the promise of God. He wavered not. He staggered not at the promise of God. He just got a hold of it. And how did he do that? Listen, one of the ways he did that is God changed his name. God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Now look, here's, here's something that, that you could do now. Uh, if, and I'm not telling you to change your name, but what he did was he heard his name, which meant father of a multitude. That's what the word Abraham actually means. Father of a multitude. So he hears what God told him. How many times a day you think he'd hear his name on average? He had all kinds of servants. He, he was a businessman. He was a man of authority and man of power. He, in his community, he was a man of power. How many times do you imagine somebody said, Abraham, father of a multitude? That's what he was hearing. If we would hear God's word as much as Abraham heard his name, you could look at the things going on around you and not consider them but rather consider the promises of God and not waver at what's happening around you. Is anybody following this? Because this is the way this works. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's what we expose ourselves to the most. Verse 21, and being pull, uh, fully persuaded there's that definition of the word faith, persuaded, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able, powerful, capable, strong, the Greek says, also, also, <coughs> also to perform or to literally to do. That's what the word perform means, to do. <coughs> and therefore, it was imputed or credited to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was credited to him, but for us also. This story wouldn't be worth a hill of beans, in my opinion, if it didn't have some kind of connection to me. I'm thinking, wonderful, big deal, great. <clears throat> so Abraham didn't have any kids. You know what I'm talking about. This happens sometimes. You, you've had this happen before in your life. Somebody get up and testify and tell all the great things that God's done in their lives. And you're sitting and thinking, big deal. It ain't happening to me. <laughs> I need some of that same stuff going on in my life. And the devil will mess with you and try to get you to build a wall up and not even listen to people that testify about the goodness of God sometimes. And, and I want you to hear this. He said, this stuff wasn't written for Abraham's sake. It was written for our sake so that we, watch this, if we, but it was written for, not written for his sake alone, that it was credited to him, but for us also to whom it will be credited, imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification, if we believe. What do you mean if we believe? Well, if you start acting like Abraham, if you start calling yourself what God called you, boy, that would just be different for most people. What's God call you? Pastor, what are you talking about? Call yourself what God calls you. Well, he calls you healed. How about when he sends this angel up behind Gideon's hiding, taking, threshing some wheat, looking out for the, the people coming in, stealing from them all the time. How they had been oppressed by their enemy. And, and God walks up through this angel, walks up and says, hey, mighty man of valor. Can you imagine how weird that would be? I mean, Gideon actually started arguing with this angel when God told him all of the things that was going to take place 
through his life. He starts saying, you know, look, listen, come on. He said, our family ain't got anything. We're some of the poorest people around here. He said, you know, all these enemies coming in here, taking all of our stuff. He said, this place is a mess. You know, you telling me that I'm going to be the mighty man that rises up, that forms an army, and we're going to defeat our enemy. That's what you're telling me? That's basically what he was saying. If we would start calling ourselves what God calls us, a mighty warrior, a victorious one, a healed, healthy person that not just walks around and gets healed when sickness is coming, but has so much supernatural health that we pass it on to others by laying hands on the sick and see them recover. That we're wealthy people, that we have peace and that we have God's joy, that we stand above the circumstances and that we no longer allow the enemy to defeat us in any form or fashion. See, when we come to that place where we start calling ourselves, let me tell you what the devil does with this stuff. He'll send people by to try to get you to compete with them about bad stuff that's going on. You ever seen somebody walk up and you almost, you almost have the feeling to do it sometimes. You think it's like it's courteous. Like, how you guys doing? Uh, you know, things are not going real good. I see you got a nice car there. Yeah, but I'm paying a big payment on it. We should be saying, yeah, but God has just blessed my socks off. I really do drive a nice car. Instead of getting in a place of competition with how rough things are or how bad it is, we need to start saying like Abraham, I'm a father of a multitude. I'm exactly what God told me I am. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I live the abundant life every day. The enemy can't steal from me, can't kill me, can't destroy my stuff or my family or anything that I've got, can't destroy me, can't destroy my ministry. I am who God said I am. Is for us also, he said. Abraham was a believer, not just somebody with faith. He had his faith in motion. Do you remember what James said about doubting in James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6? He said, if you're going to ask something from God, ask it in faith, nothing wavering. That, that, that literally says not even one. Don't even waver once. What you do, this word waver, by the way, in the Greek means to withdraw from faith, to oppose faith, to hesitate about your faith, to contend with your faith, to doubt, to stagger from your faith or waver from your faith. He said, don't do it even once. He said, if you do, he said, don't let that man think he's going to receive anything from the Lord. And he calls him double-minded. And, and the Greek actually says two-spirited. For a long time, that was kind of confusing to me in, until I realized what he was talking about was having two things going on in his spirit. I remember the old cartoons. I think they were Looney Tune cartoons, bug bunny kind of things. They had a, an angel would jump up on the shoulder of a character and the devil would jump up on the shoulder of a character. Anybody remember those? You guys are about my age. And the devil would whisper something in their ear and the angel would whisper something in their ear. Well, it gets worse when it gets down in your spirit, down in your heart, and it starts fighting there, going back and forth. And that's what James is talking about is when you just start wavering. Let me tell you what happens. The reason that happens is because you start considering things without considering your faith. The, the promises of God, because if you consider the promises of God, Abraham, 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 hey, Abraham, 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 hey, father of a multitude, father of a multitude. I imagine he probably looked at himself on occasion and thought, I don't know about this thing, God renaming me. I, I just imagine that it passed through his mind, but I'm, knowing that he's the father of them that believe, he had to have done what Paul told him to do, cast down the imaginations and say, God's right. God's come through on every promise he's made. I'm, I'm not going to turn my back on him. I'm not going to waver. I'm not going to contend with him about what he's promised me. I think it's interesting that people will contend with God about his promises. They'll, they'll fight with him. They'll quarrel with him about his promises. Thanks for joining me on the program today. Always great to have you along. Taking control of your faith is what you've been uh, watching a small portion of this series of messages. Man, the just shall live by faith. 
Do you understand that faith is a law? Uh, th that's what the New Testament says. That word law in the New Testament is defined as a governor or a regulator. In other words, faith is going to regulate what goes on in your life. It's going to govern whatever goes on in your life. I want you to order this message series. I, I just can't stress it enough. I really believe that it's going to change your life. These principles I've learned over the years, I've put them together, put them to work in my life, and they absolutely work if you will work them. You can order all of these messages uh, by going to our website, calling that number that's on the screen, or just simply write. Thank you for ordering the products. The money goes back into ministry. You're helping us take this good news around the world. If you're being blessed by the ministry here at Empowered, you can help us be a blessing to others by sowing a seed this month. Here's how you partner with us. Empowered Ministries is dedicated to reaching our world with the love of Jesus Christ. Your financial support is helping us extend God's grace to the multitudes and empowering us to reach the lost, heal the sick, feed the hungry, and to bring hope to the hopeless. Through Empowered Television, we're impacting nations by teaching believers to thrive in their calling and to live successful, powerful, and productive lives. If you're being blessed by the ministry here at Empowered, you can help us continue to do the works of Jesus by sowing a seed this month. With your gift of any size, you'll receive our monthly partner letter. And with your gift of $41 or more, we will also include a special teaching by Pastor Charles Vance that will take your faith to another level. When you become an EMT partner, you are helping us transform lives around the world. And we believe what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. Thank you so much for your gifts of support. We appreciate you. We're praying for you. Believe in God's very best is going to manifest in your life. I want to pray with those of you who are not born again, not sure about your relationship with God. I want you to know Jesus loves you, has an amazing plan for your life. Will you pray with me? Invite him into your life. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus into my life. I confess him as my Lord. I believe he died for my sins, and Father, you raised him from the dead. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and meant it from your heart, welcome to the family of God. We've put together a Get Started Packet for New Christians. It's our gift to everyone that's prayed with us today. You can get yours by going to our website, charlesvance.org, Press the New Believers tab, fill out the information. We'll get the packet right back out in the mail to you. Then get in a faith-based church somewhere and always remember, stay in the Word. You will stay empowered.